Welcome everyone to this recording of our first webinar in this series of three. Welcome also to special guests to Radar and Malcolm White. Time to bring a bit of fun back into farming and who better than to Radar to kick us off. Radar, great to have you here. Oh, it's great. I'll start my little timer. Um, hi, folks. Hey, look, not an expert in, in the subject, just an enthusiastic amateur um, who, like a magpie, I spend a lot of time at a lot of events, particularly in the agribusiness sector. I'm going to just, I'm going to rattle through a whole lot of stuff that I've seen in the last 12 months or so that I think is pertinent to kind of the, the future of farming. And I want to start um, essentially with the with the past Um it was, uh, I call it in the BC period, it's a couple of years BC before COVID, I was doing a, a series with a large agri-nutrients company on the future of farming. And we were in Invercargill, bumped into a, a guy called um, Rob um, Ord and his wife, Tony. They were uh, arable farmers. Family farm, I think they'd been on there for about 94 years or something at that stage at Scott's Gap. Um, and so continuing that lineage, lineage of arable farming down there. And, and like a lot of people, um, you know, they're thinking, what are we going to do now? And they said, look, we've got this arable farm. We really love whiskey. We want to build a little distillery on the farm so that people can come and see where the whiskey's distilled and we can point out the window and go, that's the grain, that's where it's growing, that creek up there, that's where the waters come from. And I meet a lot of people with ideas like this. And uh, you think, oh, I'd love to see how this works out. Or indeed, if it works out. Um, and sure enough, I bumped into the game uh, again at another event um, a, a few years after that. And part of that as well is I love bumping into people. I, I think one of the, the real advantages that New Zealand has was a, a quote that was from the uh, the preface of Sir Paul Callaghan's book um, about New Zealand, where he said, uh, New Zealand's not a small country, it's a big village. And, and I think that's a really important way of thinking about New Zealand. We basically know almost everybody. Each one of you is only one or two steps away from from your sector leaders and your politicians. We, we probably have more access to more people at all levels of of the agribusiness and, and country sector than a lot of other countries do. And so as I say, bump into um, a lot of people. By this stage, uh, they've got the little distillery built in, in an old shed and they're cracking into it. And I said to them, where, where did you learn about whiskey? And again, this is one of those great things. Um, Tasmania's got a very strong whiskey um, industry over there. Climate's right, they've got a lot of grain, great water. And I said, well, how did the Tasmanians learn? Because I know that um, down in Southland, uh, there's a huge you know, Mary McRae, the Hokanui moonshiners, the Scots who bought all of this out. But actually there was a modern strain as well. There was a guy from Tasmania who went to Scotland and he said, can you teach me how to distill whiskey? And the Scots whiskey master said, I will, but there is one condition. And that condition is that when you go back to Tasmania, you share this knowledge. And I thought that was a really, you know, a really wholesome and holistic way of of passing all of that knowledge on. Because as the Scots guy said, the more of us who distill, um, the better we get, the more we share all of our experience and off we go. So uh, Rob and Tony uh, got the distillery up, or all distillery. Um, they've got the little, some from first seed to first sip. I really like their little catchphrase. And then I think it was last year, 2023 Arable Awards, they picked up a whole lot of prizes for innovation. Um, they'd been farming, as I say, we did the 100th. I went down uh, Queen's birthday weekend for their 100th anniversary this year uh, of the farm. And they picked up innovation. They brought back a whole lot of um, old grains, rare grains. They uh, were using oats to make whiskey. Uh, now for the whiskey purists, Probably not what you would do, but uh, I said, so, you know, what they said to the, the Scots, why don't you, why don't you use those? They said, well, we've got our purity laws. And so we can't do that. We've got a certain way of doing things like the Germans with their drinking laws. And again, I thought that really summed up what it means to be farming in New Zealand. We're not stuck with a whole lot of these kind of traditional beliefs. We're very nimble and we're innovative based upon the fact that we had a whole lot of ancestors who decided for whatever reason, some of them didn't decide themselves, um, to leave where they were and come and change things here. So as I say, um, I, I really love that sense of this traditional um, uh, techniques and things being brought down here. We look at them, we change them, we make them into something new. Uh, and when we think of new things, I spend a lot of time around young people. Here's some of the the uh, we've got FMG Young Farmer of the Year winner this year, George Dodson. Uh, we've got the young grower, Taylor Leeborn from last year. And in the centre, um, Ben Pudu, uh, Pudu the uh, Ahu Whenua uh, dairy winner this year. As I said, there's a, there's a lot of things said about young people um, these days, but I spend a huge amount of time amongst some very, very talented people. Uh, we've got the uh, Romeo Brigato Awards next week for the viticulturalists. Um, and I see all these incredible people coming through. And what really surprises me 
it doesn't surprise me anymore is the number of people coming into the into the agribusiness sector who may never have set foot on a farm until they were 17, 18, 19, 20, and they're coming in and within a couple of years, they're full of knowledge because in a way, this is a new thing for them. They want to soak up everything they can and they're not beholden to things they've, we've all done it, things we learned from dad that he learned from his dad and they're coming in with their new ideas. Ben Pudua, for example, you know, what a great example. Young uh, Māori, um, I'm going to say, I'm 50, I can say that, young Māori um, fella and he, he had you know, grew up gang violence, domestic violence, substance abuse. He ended up in Waikaria um, uh, prison, yeah, as so many people do. And there he was exposed to agriculture for the first time and he loved it. And someone gave him an opportunity. And I think that's the, one of the most important things we can do in the agribusiness sector today is give all of these people who might not know a lot about the sector an opportunity and lift them up and bring them into the sector. And they can do um, incredible things. Uh, Likewise, within the innovation sector, um, for those of you, at, I, I host, um, well, I MC a lot of stuff at Field Days. I see all of the innovation awards. I, I thought this year was a, a fascinating kind of category. So much innovation. And often it's a lot of tech. Uh, there's a lot of little scientific devices. There's internet of things. There's various things. This year was a kind of a, a weirdly kind of practical one. I really loved um, the student prize. And we've got kids who are so innovative. And you think, hasn't everything been invented? Not yet. Um, Penny Ranger uh, invented a, a little tool called Market. She was at home with Dad, and she had to drench some sheep, and she wasn't sure which sheep she was drenching. Have I drenched this sheep, or have I not drenched this sheep? Look, we've all been there, and we've done that. She said, surely there's got to be a way. She literally invented a little marker that goes onto the side of the drench gun. It's got a little bit of chalk or something on it, and when you drench the sheep, it marks the sheep's mouth. Um I mean, it's such a simple idea. Uh, she put this into the awards, picked up the Innovation Awards, and interestingly enough, all three of the other Innovation Awards this year went to some kind of wall-based product. It astounds me, and particularly when we're dealing with people such as yourselves um, and, and the larger kind of eco-sector, why is wool not worth more, given the kind of wonderful um, and environmentally friendly product that it is? So there was fleece grow um, this year. They basically substituting the peat uh, for in greenhouses. You can use wool for that. Uh, there was kiwi fibre. Actually, it was hemp um, rather than wool. Had a kiki, um, and they're using that a lot in within fiberglass, carbon fibre, and things like that. And actually, uh, the top prize for the, uh, I think, growth and scale went to Wool Aid, which is basically um, a very fine wool merino band aid, replacing all that plastic. We never, you know, it's those little bits of plastic that we never think of. And so replacing uh, the plastic and band aids into a breathable and biodegradable um, and, and medically safe uh, little bit of a band aid. I love that kind of thinking that comes in with things like that. I also like the thinking of Mike Casey. Many of you probably familiar with Forest Lodge and Mike Casey. I love what Mike Casey is doing in that kind of knowledge sector. Here he was, he made a, a swag of money by the look of it, um, selling a, a software platform. And he went, what am I going to do now? Hadn't been farming. He said, you know what? I might open a cherry, I might start a cherry orchard. I might buy a, a beautiful piece of land near Mount Pisa in, uh, in Queenstown, plant nine and a half thousand cherry trees. And his goal was to become the first fossil free orchard, um, certainly in New Zealand, if not the world. And he is cracking along with that. And what I love about Mike, yes, it was a Greenfields project. Yes, he had some capital behind him, but he's really obsessed with radical transparency, with showing everything on the property uh, and everything that works and everything that doesn't work. There he is. He's got his little, um, the first um, electric tractor in New Zealand. It's autonomous. He can send it up and down the, the, the lines of the orchard, doing all the things that um, those little tractors do. And I just love the, the, the passion and the energy and the enthusiasm that he has to make substantial change in his sector. Um, and I think the more that we can celebrate and share that kind of energy, uh, and certainly, as I say, I think radical transparency, particularly if you're trying something and it doesn't work, it's really important to say, hey, look, I gave this a go and it didn't work so that we can all sit around and go, well, why why didn't that work? It should have worked or maybe it was never going to work. And now I've proved that it didn't work. We can all go on and do something else. And again, going back to that sense of New Zealand as a, as a, as a big village and essentially a big discussion group to discuss what we can do better in the sector. Um. I spent some time with uh, the wonderful, the ferocious Alison Jews, for those of you who know her, um, up at Waikokapu. Um, I love a catchment group. I speak to a lot of them at the moment. And what I love about Waikokapu is they have their lighthouse farmers. So they had 15 farmers who who showcased what it is that you can do. And again, um, there's a sense as well that, that 
that farmers are stuck in their ways. You know that. You know that we're not. The, the, some of the most innovative for farmers of those who have been around for many, many years. Uh, you know, you speak to people who, who were young fellas when we left the common market and they went through the kind of SMP. They saw the interest rates rise. They've been through all of the seasonal things. They've now got a bit of capital behind them, and they can make the changes that need to be made. Um, and I think that's great. And why Kawakapu again? That showcasing of what it is that you can do and the bringing of people and community together because, you know, again, um, it's a really important kind of thing. And one of the, the, the big things, I think, with anything like this, I'm obsessed with it at the moment, is, is, is capturing where you are at any given moment to be able to look at where you are slightly further down the track. Um, photographs, data monitoring, whatever it may be. Um, I'm obsessed with taking photographs out so that I can look at them even in five or six months' time or a year's time just to remind you of that little bit of progress that that has happened because slow progress, particularly when you're undergoing big changes, is certainly not no progress at all. Um, and in terms of monitoring, I'm I'm also obsessed at the moment with the Wilder Labs, the eDNA testing of waterways. I love this. I think this should be compulsory in every school, particularly every rural school in the country. And certainly, if you've not used it to test your waterways, essentially you can use the the Wilder Labs, and many of you might be familiar with it. To test what's in your little, what's in your waterways through, um, it can pick up the the DNA or the eDNA of the creatures. And what I love about this, and particularly with kids and with communities, is suddenly a waterway goes from being a creek, and you can look what's in it, the little macro invertebrates and all other kind of thing, or pick up everything that's in there, and suddenly it becomes a place where these creatures live. And you can say that creek has got galaxids or whatever it might be and kids love strange bugs you can say to your kids at the school when they've got a little waterways project or they're helping out doing some riparian um, planting this is not just a waterway this is the home of these crazy little bugs did any of you know that these exist and again it goes back to that sense of putting story and and personality into landscape and i really love their technique um likewise um, um I follow the journey of James Murray and Co. Um, and and Grant uh, with River Watch. Um, started off, uh, what started off as Aqua Watch. Uh, they were annoyed um, with um, what was going on with their river going through the farm and the widened upper. They thought hey, there must be a way to monitor it in real time. They began with a little fiberglass prototype, and now they've they've gone global. They've changed their name to Aqua Watch, and they've got these little walker they call them that will monitor um, the river in real time. Um, what is it? Monitor. It monitors uh, turbidity. It monitors um, oxygen oxygen, it monitors um, conductivity. Essentially, it's a Fitbit for water. And again, wouldn't it be great if we could get these, a little bit of eDNA testing and get these into our waterways so that in real time we can say this is what is happening season by season, week by week, almost day by day as water levels fluctuate um, through the course of things. And of course, you know, technology is not going to be the end all be all, but there's a lot of great tech out there that I think can change the way that we think about things. You're going to be familiar with Halter. Uh, I like, I talked to a guy around Halter. I said, does it, does, using Halter, the, the cow collars, great for sort of cow health and you can figure out what's going on, but does it reduce your need for stockmanship? And he said, arguably, he was an early adopter. He said, my staff are better stock people than they were before we used Halter because I, I get I encourage them to go out and stand amongst the cows. And also we suddenly started um, break feeding to the landscape. We started farming to the landscape rather than simply as we've all done, go, what is the shortest point from here to over there and run an electric fence? And he said, when people left Halter and when they went to farms without Halter, they still took that with them and they farmed around how they around how the landscape suits things. Landify has just come out connecting for people who want to sell farms with people who want to buy farms with people who want to invest in farms. Um, and if you haven't seen Oxen, uh, the little autonomous wine vehicle that they're developing down in uh, Smart Machine in Marlborough, tied up now with Puno Ricard, uh, fully autonomous. It can it can prune, mulch, spray, take photographs all in real time, and it poodles up and down, um, reducing the need for those kind of labour units. But of course. Um, it all goes back to what are we actually going to be growing? And I love the conversations that are going on around where we go with what potential crops we can have. Uh, you know, um, there are tulip farms. Uh, there are bananas growing up in Northland. There are juniper berries. You've got hops, quinoa, ancient grains. Uh, there are grass. There's any number of crops that can be grown. And I think the, the, the more that we can diversify, the better we'll be as we go through um, uh, the various things. Um, because we have a beautiful country. I think one of the most important things is we, and particularly when things are difficult at the moment is that we don't forget what a privilege it is to farm in this country we have some of the most beautiful landscapes in the world and one of the most um pertinent things excuse me that i heard was a uh, a guy he was a he was a balanced farm and viral uh, environment award winner um 
from over in Hawke's Bay, and he said, we, we would often ask them, what, what's the one piece of advice that you would have for someone else? He said, he said, what I, what I like is he said, oh, you go and find the most beautiful place on your farm and you put a bench there and then you share it with people. You take people up to that view that you love more than any other view. You go up there yourself and you just sit there and sometimes just remember to go and look at the view because we can all get caught down in the weeds with all of the problems and the issues and everything that's going on and we forget the bigger picture that we have of this gorgeous place that we get to live and to work. There are countless hundreds of millions of people in the world who could not believe what it must be like to go out day in and day out into the beautiful landscape that we have, even if it's sleeting, if there are snow flurries and if it's raining, sometimes it's nice just to look up and go, what a privilege we have to, to live and work in this particular part of the world. Um, and finally, the, um, the single best bit of advice that we've had uh, or that I've had in the last um, 12 months, we were doing a mental health um, online webinar uh, post Gabriel with foresters, fishers and farmers. Um, and there was a woman called Sandra from East Coast tied up with rural women, um, New Zealand rural women leaders. And she said, you know, I said, what's the best bit of advice you had? And she went back to her dad who'd been through Bowler. And his advice said, when you've confronted with all of these various challenges, he said, you make a list and everything, you break it all down and you put it all on your list. And I thought, yep, you know, we, we all do that. But it was where he went from that, that one step further that, that we all need to go in our, in our lives and our practices and whatever it may be. He said, when you, when, you, when you achieve a task, no matter how small, and you cross it off the list, you don't rub it out because it's really easy to look at a list with a whole lot of stuff that we've got in front of us and not remember what it is that we've already achieved. And so I say, no matter what it might be, I've got a lot of lists like that. You just make the list and you, and you cross them off. The same with the photographs, because it's easy, particularly uh, doing what it is that you do and attempting to bring about um, a change, whether it's on your own properties and your own businesses or being those lighthouses, I suppose, for other people to look at and say, well, they're doing it, why can't I do it? And, and bring people on board is to remember not only how much there is to go, but to really celebrate uh, how much it is that you've already achieved. We've come um, a huge way even in the last five years, in the last 10 years. You know, there's a belief that there's this, this it was a wonderful world uh, back in the day and rivers were all m magical and brilliant. Well, I remember um, effluent and freezing works pumping stuff straight into those rivers. Um, they were a handy kind of drain um, and they must have been appalling. But we've come, um, as I say, an incredibly um, long way. And finally, um, I really love this guy. I don't know, Lance Roper. He grows a lot of onions. Um, but uh, what he said was, why follow when you can lead? And I thought that was just a... a I think it's a really important thing as we celebrate the success of where we've come up until now and we look into the future. What we do need in this sector are a vibrant and passionate and transparent and vulnerable leaders who say, I am making a change. It's not always going to work out, but we're going to do the absolute best we can because we have the privilege and the opportunity of being a part of this landscape and the communities that we work in. So. Hopefully that um, sets the scene. I'm actually, you know, as difficult as things are, I'm massively optimistic about the kind of the, the drive and the passion of, of people like you. You wouldn't be here if you didn't believe in a better world. So um, all the very best. Hugh. Thanks, Radar. Thanks. Really appreciate you taking the time and some great words there. It's, it, it is worth recognising the role that farmers play and uh, innovations and other things that are going on in that space. And uh, Thank you for the encouragement and some of those wise words that you you you, you bring to the end of that presentation. No problem at all. Hey, look, I, I know I've gone uh, th two or three minutes on, but if anyone had any questions, happy to take them if there's time now or failing that, I'll let you get on with your with your sessions. We we, we might keep moving. Thanks, Radar. But all right. We, no problem. We, if people do have comments, we'll um, if you can put them in the chat, we'll um, hold them and maybe maybe get in touch with. If, if Absolutely. We You've got a couple more sessions coming up as well. So, um, yeah, uh, we do. Uh, hey, look, follow up. As I say, apologies for not being able to stay. All the very best with your uh, session today and ongoingly. No, that's been a great intro. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Nice to meet you all. So, yeah, a, a, a really good way to bring us into where we're looking to go and, and with some positive spin and a little bit of lightheartedness in there. Um, but you know, I think we're one of the reasons we put this on. Obviously, is you found you all all the attendees on here are part of our ecological outcome verification program. But what we want to look at really more is is um, how, 
you know, we're we're kind of in a bit of a rut. Farmers, yeah, farmers are at are at really. You know, we're we're part of a production system blamed for the harm that's happening. But we're also recognised as the last hope. I mean, if, if we're blamed for causing the damage, but we're also recognised as the people that are actually going to are the only ones that can really do something about changing it. And it's a pretty tough gig. So, um, and because you know, farmers that are involved in nature, they're connected with nature. You really expect them to to have you know best quality, of, best standards of welfare, quality of life, um, and. But but in reality, it's quite different. When we look at the stats in farming as a profession, we actually lead in most of those stats around depression, suicide, and 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 mental health issues. So where's where's this disconnect? What what you know? How do we how do we break out of that? How do we change that situation in a way that's going to deliver more help, if you like, to the system that we work in? Um, you know, it's it's kind of our nature to hang on to a current system and the work that I do and some of our team are on here as well. We experience that we make decisions if, if you like trying to hang on to our current system. We don't we we look at it in parts and try and change part of it, but in reality we're not really making decisions based on a whole in a way that's going to bring bring change, bring better outcomes and particularly outcomes for health. Many of the practices, if you like, that have become normalized and that we keep going back to or try to justify in some ways, work against the health, if you like, that we're trying to create in that system. We're trying to hang on to a system that we know is broken. So how do you so how do we shift to a more regenerative state, if you like, or a state that actually is more is better able to bring health to our to our system, to ourselves, and able to identify how we start thinking and planning what we want our land to look like. What do we want it to be in generational time? How do we create a system that can actually deliver health and provide for generations in the future, whether that's our own families or whether that's um, you know, just adding adding health into that system? How do we bring energy back into that system? So that yeah, a big part of that is about our decision making. And Malcolm's going to talk to us shortly about the process that he went through, if you like, in terms of decision making and how he brought about change on his own farm and where that's landed up to. But a big part of it is that is is you know really observation, recognizing actually, for example, animals are not just about production. Animals we focus and we look at and make a lot of decisions around animals as a production base. But actually animals are the best tool that we've got available to bring health back into our land. So how do we start looking at those animals differently? You know, we're we're in the business of of farming the sun. I mean, everything we do within the land has got to be energized by the sun. To be to to get that energy into our ground and to actually benefit from the use of that sun, we've got to have green leaf above ground. So, so just simply thinking about ways that we can actually bring more green grass into our system so that we're energizing that system better. To actually lead to better health outcomes, which means that we become less dependent and reliant on inputs, starts to move us in a way that becomes more healthy from an economic, from a um, ecological, and and also from a social point of view. Yeah, you know, just um, yeah, you know, we look if we just look at the health of our projects, that the nutrient content of and the toxic levels in our content that we produce have. Um, nutrient contents down down dramatically and toxic levels have gone up you know, a long way as well. And we're seeing a lot of a lot of the chronic diseases and what we call wicked diseases that are a consequence of the way we farm our food. And and this is generic, I'm not not specifically you know, people in this room. But it's interesting, you know, um, Linus Pauling, who you know, Nobel Prize, two Nobel Prizes, um, you know, made the comment that nearly all disease can be traced to a nutritional deficiency. And, you know, which means that we're again in a position that we can actually influence that by changing what we do. And and provided one has the correct level of vitamin, mineral and nutritional input, the body can overcome disease. So, you know, we, and it's the same within our pastures. When we bring up our BRICS levels, actually, we can get those to a level so that they actually become healthy enough with enough immune status to actually resist disease and pests. But it's not easy. And we know that we have to deal with the complexities of animal farming, regulation, weather, markets, etc. Yet we're expected to make things work. 
we do know how we can do it. It's a design issue. So how do we design to change the outcomes to bring life back to soils, plants, animals and people? We hang on to what we know and consider things through that lens. So we tend to make decisions that take us back to where we were. So if we change the way we look at things and think about things, we actually change what we see. And I guess that's a little bit of what we want to go through in this series of, of webinars. How do we use EOV, the information we've got, and how can we actually shift out of the state that we're in to one that can bring more health in the system? So I'd like to introduce Malcolm at this stage. Malcolm, if you like, he's my, my poster boy for um, regenerative farming, and he's yeah, he started his process through holistic management. We're going to um, just go through a series of um, themes, if you like, with with Malcolm. And um, if I can find, uh, so and just sort of introduce Malcolm into each of those themes and he can talk about that and we'll we'll walk through that. So, yeah, we're all good to go, Malcolm. Very good. Thanks, Hugh. Any Thanks, comment yeah. you want to make I'm, at the I'm start? Rather, or? I'm, I'm, I'm rather shocked at being a poster boy. Help. <laughs> no, it's good. Really appreciate you um, putting yourself on the block and, and being prepared to walk us through some of your background. But, um, you know, I mean, you know, discussions that we've had, you know, you've indicated a little bit about where you came from, a little bit of your background, pretty conventional, you've, you've um, through the training and the way you started in the UK and came to New Zealand. Um, do you want to give us a little bit of background, a little bit of history about where you started from um, and, and what in that, if you like, identified that it wasn't working and you needed to shift? Um, yes. Um, so... So basically, same as every, 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 everyone else of, of, of my generation, with the, the same sources of information, universities, fertilizer companies, um, beef and lamb, best practice. And um, we're trundled along, okay, for, 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 for a fair old while. And, this is only looking back in hindsight on reflection, but we, we'd made a decision um, that it would be ha really nice to get half the lambs away at weaning fat, because then, well, you could go to the beach, you could you could you could swan off, every, every everything would be easy life. Uh, also, at the time, we were leasing a higher altitude block, which meant on 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 this farm we we were quite most of the stock, a half percent of the stock was on this farm anyway. So the problem with that decision was um, we basically left lambs on news for 14 to 16 weeks, which meant we were weaning in January. And unwittingly, we just set ourselves up for a drought. If it went hot and dry, your covers were so low, the consequences were inevitable. Anybody could see it. So in the late 2000s, so 2007, 8, 9, um, we got three lower than normal rainfall years and had basically what we felt with three droughts on the on on the trot. And um, things were looking pretty bleak. And the Hawke's Bay Regional Council set up a talk day uh, run by John King, where the, the, the title was Never Run Out of Grass. So I went there. Uh, I, I, I was that 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 caught my attention, and um, went to listen to him. And um, it it it, it I. I I, I, I said to him, I, I mean, this is all very well, but at that stage, I blamed the weather for the situation. And I said, you know, what can you do about no rainfall? And he told me to go back and look at the roadside, which to be frank at the time, I was, I was quite insulted at. But when I did go look at the roadside, I, I saw that the, 
the roadside, or it wasn't Waikato dairy pasture by any means, but there was pasture. And the contrast with the dust and nodding thistles in the paddock was extreme. And then that was a, a pivotal moment because it made me realize then that, ah, oh, what was going on in the paddock was I had done it, is what we had done. It wasn't the capricious act of the guards or anything. It was purely um, mismanagement. So that ownership of responsibility then actually gives you agency, it empowers you, because if you made the situation, well then obviously you can now correct it. So, so you talk a low battery and low energy, basically where we shifted from was a, a, a farm that we'd pretty much desertified, we'd, the battery was flat, we'd, 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 we'd stuff the life out of it. Yeah, thanks Malcolm, that's, uh, that's a really good intro. And just, well, I just remind people that um, we'll work through this uh, interview with, with Malcolm. Got any questions, comments, thoughts, you know, please bang them on the chat and we'll, we've got, we've set time aside to come back to that and we want to get as much discussion going in that final session as, as we can. So just moving on to that, so I mean you've recognised that you've stuffed up, you've got a system that is not working and um, creating, and so so how we, how did you start? How did you then think about how you're going to do that differently and transition into something else? How did you recognise where you wanted to go? Um, I, I wouldn't, I, 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 we didn't initially, there was no such thing as Regen Ag, and there wasn't, there wasn't so much uh, a, a recognition that we were going anywhere. We, we just knew we had to had to make a change. We, we couldn't keep going as as we were. So what we did was we signed up for John King's um, holistic management course. And and again, I still uh, uh, went into that course with a very still a very reductionist mindset. Well, what I was latching onto was not running out of grass. I, I love that concept. Don't run out of grass. But when you do holistic management, the holistic plan grazing is actually the last segment you do. You, you start off with nebulous things like quality of life. What do you want your life to be, be like? Which is something I'd never thought about. Then financial management. And then uh, some e ecological ideas like ecosystem processes, which again was all new information. But the point about that new information is it slowly opens the mind and, and it gave you another way of looking well another context for for, for 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 looking at the farm so same as anyone it it, it, it was a process it was you, you're really just you're getting new information and you're wondering well now how do i apply this and just try and make things better so you, you kind of go from there so having done the um holistic management course we, we then had the concept of um, the, 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 the ecosystem processes, so the solar cycle, mineral cycle, water cycle, and, and the community dynamics. And part of that was just um, adjusting the, the, the recoveries. So basically, the first thing we did was we said, well, let's not control the spring growth because we'd always hammered the grass in spring because we're always afraid of it getting away and not being able to finish lamb. So that was a fear driven decision. Just, just let it grow. Just just let it do what it's going to do. And um, that that um, brought on a different set of problems we had to solve. But it did it did it did it was a dramatic transformation. So now you you can you start seeing two different re results from different actions. So. You, you, after that, it becomes a process of slowly, year, year on year, you, you just, you, you start to realize your grazing and how you graze is, is, is pretty fundamental. And you, you start, um, it, it basically starts a journey, you, you, you're revising it all the time. And in terms of a, 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 a transition, that process, I would say it's still ongoing, we haven't perfected it by any means. So, so how hard was that, Malcolm? I mean, you know, one of the things that we we see in 
you know, is, is um, you know, one of the big pressures, if you like, in, in, in moving away from a system that's become conventional or normal into one that's different is the social pressures of, of the areas and your know, people around and organisations that you're part of. How did, you know, how did that show up and what you were trying to do and how did you cope with that? Um, it's probably, um, so, so, um, no change at all, not, not changing anything from, from, from where we are, wasn't a good place to be either. So if you've, um, if you, if, if you really flatten the battery and, and, and the farm's not looking a picture, you've got no, You've got no um, social kudos, if you like, to lose anyway. <laughs> You're at rock bottom, mate. So, you know, from that point of view, there was nothing to lose. Yeah, it's good. It's a really, it's a really good point. I mean, you know, it's um, as I sort of said in the little bit of an intro, and you know, we. We tend to try and hang on to what we've got rather than recognize or you know making that recognize recognizing that in fact it's not working having that kind of monitoring and getting to that point and it certainly seems to be a common theme if you like in the people that have made the shift into well, i don't like this concept of regenerative agriculture but bringing regenerative principles into their farming you know they've recognized the systems failed them it's not working for them anymore and they've actually got to make a radical change or they you know some of the early guys like Charles Massey and some of these others, they, you know, we're going to go bust and lose their business. And they've, they've had some kind of dramatic recognition. And I guess part of what our hope in this is, is that we can introduce other people to some of that without them having to go get to that same level of, of, of outcome before they recognise that, um, you know, this is, um, this is not working and uh, start making some kind of changes. So we when you, you know, so you you sort of came through the shift into holistic management and then um, this move towards down this regenerative pathway. So how how did how did you start to bring those principles, if you like, into the farming operation, and how did HM really help you in that space? Um, beep, 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 beep. um uh... Holistic management actually was the process. It 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 was it it was how it it was how we did it. It 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 was the whole framework by 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 which we started to operate. And 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 and, and the real the, the the thing about holistic management is 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 a lot of people think it's about the grazing system, but it's not. It's it's about it's about identifying your context, so what you want from the farm, and then just testing your decisions to see if they're in line with that context you've identified. And part of your context is your four ecosystem processes. I haven't met a farmer yet who doesn't want to leave the farm in a better state than when they found it without defining what that is. But one, I'd suggest one way of defining it is all four ecosystem processes are improving. And ideally, you kind of want them humming. You, you want you know, each, <clears throat> they're the kind of musketeers, aren't they here? You can't, they're kind of one for all and all for one. You can't have the great water cycle and then everything else flat. You, 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 you either, they, they're either all lift together or they all collapse together. So, so it's, um, it's so, so what you're trying to do is, as you mentioned earlier, your your decision is to how, how do I catch the most solar energy and start to um, you know, how how do we bring that into the system, and then from there every every everything else falls out. Of course, <clears throat> it's it's a holistic system, so you've still got. You know, you, you've still got the character of grass growth. You, you, you've still got animals to feed. You, you've still got stock to finish, and and there's certain, um, you, you know, but you can't <laughs> half the time. So half the time you can't even. 
it's just it's just changing one thing at a time you know you're not it's 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 it's, it's, it's a bit of a cliche you, you really you're looking at it and you go well this has happened um how, do, how can we make it better yeah no that's it's um yeah i think this interconnectedness or interdependence of things is something again that you know, keep coming back to look yeah this identifying and thinking and making decisions through the whole rather than trying to um identify parts of that and and i think you know again this concept of um making decisions that add health or take you closer to your holistic context than than making uh, decisions in response to a need. Um, do you want to for you a bit, maybe, or just explore that a little bit? Okay, so the, so, so if, 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 if you like, the, the, the difference in holistic management is, as um, Alan Savory said, um, points out I, I mean I mean we make decisions to solve a problem meet a need or or satisfy a a a desire and that becomes a context for the, the decision so like we're saying when we went for that um finishing all the lambs fat at weaning that was a desire and we didn't explore the context within the whole of 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 whether that would would actually, you, you know, we never asked the questions is, well, what would be the consequence of that? It just seemed like a good idea and we, we, we implied it. And so had we applied the holistic management lens to it and then done the decision testing questions, which is a fundamental to it, you'll be asking, you're asking cause and effect. Um, does it address weak links? Um, yeah, but is this the best, you know, that you've got your marginal reactions, you've got your gross profit analysis, and last thing is your gut feel, is this taking you in the direction? So we probably would have, I mean, we might have done it some years and years that were suitable, but we wouldn't have tried to do it every year. We, we, we would have been much more, it's, it is that holistic thing, much more aware of you're working within an ecological context. And, and 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 actually you're trying to maximize the energy input into the system um some of the um easier ones was uh, a decision like drenching lambs why why do you drench lambs well you drench lambs obviously because they're wormy and then that's the decision but if you apply the same testing questions so your number one is cause and effect. Does drenching your lamb address the cause? Well, unless the cause was lack of albendazole, clearly it doesn't. So therefore, there's another cause of why the lambs are wormy. So drenching is never going to solve it. Holistic management gives you that those questions. So what seems obvious suddenly becomes questionable. Another one I always point out to is you have a weed. Well, then spray it. The weed's the problem. But if you're Contact to where you're farming is to produce healthy food and improve the vitality of your farm, then suddenly spraying might not be the best option. So just just yeah. And 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 we do that sort of case by case all the time. So yeah, so I mean I'd be um yeah, yeah. I mean one of the things that I find is impressive with what you've done is is that you you know you've stuck to this over quite a long time and uh, I, I know that's not easy and and you know for me you know I've, i see the results when i come on your place and yeah we we run ecological outcome verification on there to, so we can monitor how that's changing um but so yeah what, what keeps you going on that what keeps you focused on that and um you know as you say you're still you're still on this journey you don't you know you're not sure where it's going but it's um but it's moving well, you in the right direction. What keeps us going? It's 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 just so much. It, it's it's it, it's given us agency back. I mean, then then we're free to stuff it up and 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 we're free to make it better. We're 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 no longer sort of victims of 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 weather or you know 
capricious fates or anything. It's it's down to us. That, that's that's kind of empowering. Um, the 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 changes we've seen, the increase of insect life and bird life, are just they're just a source of great joy. I mean, we 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 go out to move the cows, and we've just got hundreds of swallows and flantails just flitting around and. But then everything goes quiet because of because of falcons come flying over. Then everything comes back out again. It's, it's just it's just so life. I mean, it's just beautiful. It's 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 it's, it, it's fun. To be honest, it it, it makes it, it incredibly interesting. Um, um, it's it, it's also um. You, you kind of lose the fear. You, 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 I'm no longer, I'm no longer afraid of grass getting away. I'm no longer afraid of, you know, just, just bring it on. We'll, we'll cope with it. Touch wood. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's great. I mean, it's a great. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a common consequence we hear, isn't it? Is it brings brings. The fun back of the farming and the enjoyment and and as you say the agency and and basically the empowerment and I think you know those are I mean those are outcomes that we'd really love to see more farmers experience because it, you know we're um, yeah farming is tough and we're we're seeing the outcomes of that at the moment and and um, it's very difficult to break out of a system that creates this kind of dependency but um, I mean one of Interesting. I mean, and, and I'm not wanting to contradict Tirado at all, but yeah, one of the things that he talked about quite a lot was the technology, if you like, that's coming in from a measurement point of view. And yet, you know, you've just talked about, I mean, you know, I'd be interested in your comments on that. I mean, um, you don't use any of that kind of, I mean, you're, you're getting outside and you're recognising and experiencing what that looks like and those changes and monitoring those in more an observational way is what what are your own thoughts around that um i think um we're actually living in 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 a, in a really exciting time in terms of burst of information and, and and creativity that's coming so some of the measurements uh, 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 again will we'd have to um I mean, the e, the EOV is technically something that that that's that's going to grow and 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 become more detailed and become more technological, if we like. And 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 yeah, any anything that that helps because it, because ultimately you can't manage what, what what you can't measure. So so I don't think we're we're, we're totally averse to. to Technology, it's it, it's it's hugely useful. It's it's learning to apply it in your own situation. But 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 the bigger picture, the birds and and the life out there, it just hits you. You can't escape it. But then the detail of trying to improve and grow your business and do things better. I mean, every every everyone's always trying to do that, and you've you've got your sources of of, of information, and that's what I'd say. The the interweb and and regen ag is what is brought is a whole burst of new information that gives you new ideas which you can bring into your holistic management framework and test it's it's actually bloody exciting to be honest the the the, the, the new biological d d discoveries that are being made around and about are, are intriguing it, it, it's it, it's a bit of an aside but it shows um that the the the, the, the the biggest organism in the world is a is a fungus in northwest states and it covers 500 k's and what they found they can in, in, introduce a radioactive isotope on one end and it can be detected 500 k's away 0.03 seconds later and when you think of the power of that i mean that's going into quantum physics and when you think well that's that's a fungus and that's in your soil and that's out. i mean we're just at the start of 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 understanding what's the the, the, the absolute um fascinating but fascinating um uh, life that's going on there and, and the processes that are happening but i mean we're only just starting to explore them it's 
I, 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 yeah, I, I can't help but be motivated and, and inspired. I, I love it. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's it's um, it's great that you know that still gives you excitement to want to keep farming, and you know you've been at it a while, and and um, you know that, as I say, yeah, your your place shows you that yeah the the approach that you take to it, and um, but um, yeah, so I mean, if there any any other sort of comments that you'd like to sort of put in there, I mean, I you know that. I mean, you've talked, you know, one of the questions I was going to take was really you know, how it's working for you and the beneficial outcomes. And, you know, you've talked about some of those, but, um, you know, what about family, community, some of those other sort of areas that um, that show up? Um, okay. The most um, exciting thing for us is it, is it, is it, is it, is it, 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 it um, is it is it, it's meant that Nikki, our daughter, wants to come home and carry it on because she's um, it's gripped her interest. Um, uh, our son Chris is the same; he's much more interested in what's happening on the farm now but, than he ever used to be. So, so that social aspect—I mean, <laughs> it's just wonderful for us, really. Um, uh, uh, an, another. Um, Aspect of I found is, is 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 I reckon nature's default is basically one of abundance, and anything shy of abundance is what we have done. So therefore, it, it's it, it's 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 up to us to, you know, just just try find ways of of find, you know, through 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 the through the context of the ecosystem principles. Just, just, just find ways of trying to steer the ship back, back, back towards p p potential abundance. Um, um, uh, the, the, the other thing we've found over time is, is our stock have become a lot more content. So cattle are just, um, they're just happy. Um, I, I don't know, how, I don't know how else you, you describe it. The sheep are just. But they're just happy, so that gives you a, a, a nice feel. You, 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 you I, I, I think soil health and ecological health actually drives production. So until, so unless, ultimately, anyway, we we now know there's no technological fix for a biological problem. So the only way you're going to fix biological problems is through trying to understand biology as well as you can. Because yeah, you, I guess. I, you, sorry, Malcolm. I guess I guess that's where I was going a little bit with the question around tech and technology, trying to provide solutions to those biological problems. So I think it was good that you know you dig, dig into yeah you know, bring that up. I think that's that's useful. Yeah. So 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 it's learning. It's still a process of learning. I mean, we have to learn sort of how biology is how ecology functions more than just biology. It's we farm in an ecological context, it, 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 and 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 it's learning how we in, in influence that in a positive way, basically. And 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 it's it's still a learning process. And I don't think the learning will will, will ever stop. I mean, all, all all through human history, they've always thought. Oh, now we know everything, and then the, and then quantum physics comes along and realise we know bugger all, really. Yeah, but it, but but it's also interesting, isn't it? I mean, we still don't know. We still can't explain fire yet. It, it still works for us, and sometimes yeah. we 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 worry too much about being able to explain things, and yet you know, as you say, we can we can look out the window and we can see that things have actually changed for the positive because you know when it's so you know it comes back to thinking a little bit what health looks like in our system and and um we can you know i always think with the shift into regenerative farming is that you feel it before you can measure it i mean that the as you say the animals look better the pastures healthier drought yeah you know, there's just life in the system and and you can feel that mm, very much so yeah no that's that's been excellent i really you know really really appreciate you know your wisdom and and you know just uh you know the way you've 
way you've shifted, how it shows up, and you know the way you, you know, how apparent that is in your farming situation. So um, I think we'll we'll throw it open to discussion. I mean, if there's any specific, I think there's a couple of things on the chat, Bruce, Emily, um, any. Uh, yeah, Joe, did you, you had a question that you've popped in there. Did you want to ask that? Is he gone? Uh, I can see him. I think he's just you trying to unmute. Uh. <laughs> oh, maybe I have to do that. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh. No. There we go. Pressing the button too many times. Uh, I, I think actually uh, Malcolm answered that question. I was just kind of um, inquiring about, um, I guess, the risk assessment you would take um, with, with regards to making a change. Um, you, you kind of said that a lot of people, if you're at rock bottom, you've got nothing to lose. But what if you're not at rock bottom? What if you're just kind of um, sailing along but you want to make a change but there's also the the risk factor of going backwards um does um, is that a consideration um yes it's always it, it, it's always there in, in the back of your mind but generally uh, um we're really fortunate that that they're they're um they're they they've been case studies all over the world of people and 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 the and, I, and and that's something I've forgotten to stress is 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 the internet has made a lot of this um, a lot easier than it otherwise would have been. So so because you got examples from other places in the world, most things we're, we're trying is, is things we kind of read about other people doing, and 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 ostensibly it's worked for them so we sort of feel well there's a good chance it's going to work for us and 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 that's why we move that way yeah thanks malcolm it, um i, 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 I think it's quite it's quite important to stress i'm 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 not much of an in, in, in innovator I'm, I'm i'm kind of much more of a follower so so, so it's just gleaning what's what other people. It's learning from what other people have already done. So, how do you just to develop that? So, I mean, as you say, there's a there's a lot of information. There's a lot of prescriptions, if you like, around being regenerative. How do you filter that? How do you work out what you think makes sense for you from um, the concept of planting a sunflower being and being regenerative? <laughs> um, I don't feel right. That's a really good question. I'll have to think about that one. Um, I guess, I, I guess it, I guess there has to be some level of intuition. It sort of, it, it, it sings to you. Well, it doesn't really. Um, that's, yeah. I can't, I can't, I can't see how else to, to describe it. There's. Some things you read and you go, yep, that makes sense, and that fits with my worldview. So happy to explore it. And other times you come along and you go, ooh, no, I don't think so. so uh, I think everyone's the same. Yeah, thanks. That's I think that's an excellent answer around inter intuition. Um, any other questions, comments, team? Um, Tim has um, has left, but he left a question in the chat. He was just asking um, what broader impacts in your community have you observed based on your change in management practice and perspective? So maybe other yeah other farmers in the community or just your community in general? Um, yeah, I, I was I, I, we were very fortunate that. When we did holistic management, our our, 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 our immediate neighbour attended the same course, same course. So, so we were pretty, you know, we're pretty much on the same wavelength. Um, and around us, I, I, I think you'll find that, um, um, you know, there's if if if, if, if there's no sharp line between. Um, 
conventional and regenerative they 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 they, they are just labels and 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 the way farming evolves is 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 that the, the ideas that are seen to work in if you like on one side are going to be adopted by the other side so uh, it's it's just a process it is it's, it's an evolution some are further down the road than others but i think it, everyone's aware of it now and they and 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 because of the um environmental pressures you, every, every, everybody's having to ask questions as to how they go forward yeah thanks malcolm, uh, sorry i was just going to say malcolm i love the flat battery and anal analogy um and i wonder malcolm if a lot of people don't really realize that their their battery is flat um yes <laughs> I, I agree with you and, and 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 that's why i talk about nature's default is 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 abundance the, the, the real problem here i mean if, if you kind of set your compass we're, we're kind of heading towards the unknown because we don't know what a fully charged battery looks like i mean none of us have seen it so it's it's it, it, you know it the battery's on tri trickle charge at best, and sometimes ac accidentally <laughs> we pull the bloody plug out. And then we've got to re-plug in and go again. I mean, the problem is with farming is is is, is everything is on an annual basis. So, so, so you muck up spring, well, you've got to wait 12 months to get a chance at another spring, haven't you? So it's, it's slow. Yeah, so maybe we don't believe how good it could actually be. I don't think we know how good it could actually be. Yeah, yeah, I think I think I think that's that's a really fair comment. Is and and I think it's you know it's a concept that's really difficult for us to get our heads around. I mean, we're hardwired to predictability, and we're hardwired to um, expect that we can put A and B together, and it's going to make C or Z or something. It's going to be a predictable outcome, but. Yeah, we work in living systems which are based around complexity rather than you know rather than linear outcomes, and that's that's a really big mindset shift to make. Um, and so again, it, it you know the how do we encourage people or give people the confidence, if you like, to start to move away from the parts that we keep coming back to and try and change on a one by one basis, that rather than, and I guess that's again, coming back to where holistic management and holistic management training and decision making through that concept of a whole and the how, how do we plan, if you like, how do we plan complexity and how do we start to think about designing for the abundance that can come from bringing a systems change? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, for us, it, we, 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 because we went there, holistic management way right at the start. I mean the rest is is has just followed on. You know, it hasn't hasn't been particularly difficult or anything. It's just been a natural consequence of doing what we did before. Uh, we just got another question here from Amanda. Um she's Amanda, did you would you like to ask your question? Hi, can you hear me okay? I can't. I, this Microsoft Teams doesn't work terribly well for me and keeps on kicking me off things. We can but hear you. Yeah. I was just interested in knowing how you describe your kind of financial resilience now compared to, say, before you started um, the holistic management and those practices. I guess what I'm asking is, uh, uh, are you much more profitable now than you were in the past, or are you looking at a balance of outcomes, which makes you describe it as much better? Uh, uh, um, thanks, Amanda. Um, the the financial management comes under as part of the holistic management, and one of the one of the one of the, um, if you like, the business saving ideas that came out of holistic management was the one that um, you make profit your first expense. 
So profit is intentional. So when I, 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 I went to university and all and, and, and everything like that, and, and all, all the financial management I was ever taught, gross margins, you, you name it, profit is what fell out at the end. Once everybody else has had what they want out of you, you get left with a profit. Holistic management turns that round completely. Holistic management says, for every $100,000 of income, because don't forget, every farmer, all the income comes to us first. If we've got nothing left at the end of the year, it's because we're giving it all away. So out of $100,000 of income, if you want $80,000 profit, you state that as your goal. All right, now you've got to run farm on the other 20000 and if people say, oh, you can't do it, but you're only investing in inputs because they're supposed to make you more money. If you run out of money at the end of the year, how successful were those inputs? Holistic management makes you challenge it. You challenge every, every expense. It's human nature that expenses always rise to meet income. So, so you've acknowledged that and then you've yeah, you, in your budgeting, you're very intentional about your profit. So we, 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 we pull the profit out first and run the farm on the expected difference. Any comments, Amanda? Um, well, just, I, I probably should admit that I'm a chartered accountant at this particular point. <laughs> Um, so I, I guess what I'm just interested in is, does it mean that you have, um, I, I, have you diversified as part of this process? Um, I, I guess what I'm struggling with is we are farming livestock, we also have vineyards, we also have another, a number of other potential and actual innovations leading to products. Um, and um, that's where I see us as going because um, I, sort of, I feel that there, there has, when I'm managing for what we've got, you know, my livestock numbers and the prices I get from a market over which I have no control mean that I, I actually can't but, you know, I'm in, I'm in hiding to nothing. I can't. There's very little I can actually do, even if I um, don't have any inputs, because I'm still exposed to huge market variation, which can, you know, just I'm just a price taker, basically. Sorry, that's a that's a mumbled question, but I'm. Yeah, I understand to... that. Yeah. Yeah. Um. um yes. Uh, it, 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 there's there's been lots of um research done um you know, globally on, on farmer re returns and and basically interestingly enough your 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 product price um isn't that well correlated with people's profitability again it's because of the problem i mean if if, if you get a really high pro product price well you, you it's human nature the, the expenses just come up to rise the income anyway so so it, it's it's just it's just human nature, isn't it? Um, we're we're always looking for the new and the interesting, and we're gonna we're gonna make investment to, to, to decisions, and and so we should. I'm, I'm not saying anyone shouldn't. Um, so we should. It, it's what it's, it's it's what motivates us. But perhaps some of them haven't. You know, they they don't work as well as what we intended. Mm. Malcolm, would you like to just give a brief? I mean, you've changed the way you market and and sell your products um, more direct to consumer. Do you want to just give us a little bit of a brief, quick outcome, but you know, quick overview of what that how that works for you? Um, well, we sort of we sort of fell into organics. It was it it, it was never an uh, a, 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 an ultimate goal. But it has it has meant we get slightly higher prices um, sometimes. <laughs> if, 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 if anything, they're, 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 they're steadier prices, so we kind of know what we're going to get, and we 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 can budget uh, accordingly. But 
Yeah, it's not it's not hugely more than and anyone else, and it's still it's still sheep and beef, you know. So so your income is that number of cattle or that number of lands times the price, and that's what you got to play with. But your farming system has allowed you to take inputs out. Um, in general, I'd say that your stock that you provide uh, in consistently better order than 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 many because you've got more control over that system. Would that be fair? Um, we we try to get our cost of production really low, so um, so there's a profit in it. Yes, but but we've done it the other way. We're taking the profit first, so we have to so or so so every input then is on a case of a case of where we think we're going to so so um so another concept in holistic management is you for any for, and, and it's not just holistic management it's it's management practice but for for every enterprise you 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 have a weak link so so wherever you're going to invest you always invest in 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 the weak link and and yeah, it's it's pretty logical, really. It's common sense. Just, but 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 you do have a break in any one year. What what what's available to spend? Thanks, Malcolm. Um, yeah. So when we we've got you know, on the call, we've actually got you know a variety of people are doing different things in different ways. Any anyone want to make comment on some of the things that they're trying and? How they're showing up for them. I mean, I think yeah, you know, this whole laying layering of enterprise, bringing more opportunity back on the land to diversify income. Um, I, you know, I see those as a as a way of the future. So, um, be really interested in you know, comments from you know, some of the attendees and what how they're trying things and what's working and what's not. Any volunteers? Okay, well, um, we won't put people on the spot. But um, no, Malcolm, thank you very much for you know what's been what's been a really informative and and useful uh, you know, background, if you like, and and wisdoms in terms of what what you've done, how that journey's gone, and what's worked for you. Um, I think yeah, there's some really insightful stuff in that. And um, you know the opportunity for people to come on, you know, to get recordings and think about and 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 think about some of those things that you've been through that might work or help them. Um, you know, I think you know some of the, you know, from our point of view, you know, we've we use it. You know, it, it's probably useful just to give a little bit of an insight and in, in ecological outcome verification and what it is that we're measuring and how that works. And, and I think. It's not well understood that I mean we we I guess I uh, we try not to rely too much on what we call metrics or or um, or measurements if you like that take us back into a mechanistic or industrialized system but it's more about again trying to measure what health looks like in a system so yeah part of that's defining it as you know as you'd understand we measure. Um, Biological indicators at the soil surface, which inform us as to the health of those ecosystem functions that Malcolm talked about. But actually, what we're doing is in in those functions is that we're measuring potential or more more correctly missing potential. So within you know, we've got multiple eco regions in New Zealand. Each of those eco regions is um, defined, if you like, uh, geologically and Top, topographically and and has unique characteristics. So the um, flora, particularly in those regions, has some similarities. As um, and we set. So in each of those regions, we have um, a an area, if you like, that we select. That's what we call, and it might be made up from multiple farms, but it represents what we see as the best. Um, regenerative potential you know, or, or an area that's closest to the potential within that region that we use as a reference site. So when we go and measure ecolo the ecological health or create that ecological health index, it's done, if you like, in reference to what we think is the um, potential of each of those functions within the region. 
So the score that you get actually is the score against where that potential sits. And that difference is, if you like, the unrealized potential that sits within the land or that sits within that living system particularly. So it's not, it's not, it's not an absolute metric or a measurement. It's actually a measure, you know, that again, the, the whole concept of regenerative shift is is um, you know, regenerative is about living. Living, you know, living systems have the unique characteristic of that ability to self-maintain and self-regenerate. And we want to be adopting systems, if you like, that help realize that potential that lives in that living system. So that's that's the information, if you like, that we want to get out of doing EOV on an annual basis, creating that index, giving a series of indicators that you can then look at to help you in that decision making. So again, it was one of the really useful things that I wanted Malcolm to cover, which he did extremely well, is that concept of decision making and how we start making decisions, if you like, to realize what we call that unrealized abundance. Only living systems can do that for us. So when we start using um, industrialized processes, if you like, or we keep going back into making decisions around the way we've done that um, on you know, reliance on inputs, use of um, in, you know, particularly inputs that are going to damage the life in our soils and that life in our soils is going to be fundamental to how we change the health of the system. They become our opportunities. And I guess part of what we want to be able to do a lot more is how do we use EOV and the information that comes from that and within your own context in terms of how that can help you change. And yeah, simplistically, if we if we can grow if we can just cover more grass, or we could just you know carry more grass through a period through most of our, our year, we bring more energy into that system. And if we bring more energy into that system, we then support the different outcomes, if you like, or the different or those functions that we talk about in terms of mineral cycle, water cycle, and and, and diversity or community dynamics. The other thing that becomes really obvious by way of opportunity is is how do we start to farm in a way that actually keeps our ground covered for longer? Because again, they, they become some of the biggest impacts, if you like, that we have that keep taking us back to where we're trying to come from and damaging damaging our soil. So they're not they're not necessarily big shifts, as, as Malcolm identified. We, you know, they they become more around a change in thinking and and how do we how do we make changes to our system in a way that's actually going to start to show up in creating health rather than keeping it and taking us back to where we where we come from? So again, it's that it's a mindset mindset shift, but it's 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 pretty difficult to do. Yeah, if if if, if I could just follow on with one insight that that um, dawned on me was because the um, Ecosystem processes are, are, are musketeers, are all for one and one for all. You actually, um, you actually can't have effective water cycle, solar cycle, or mineral cycle without increasing biodiversity. It just yeah. won't happen. So that's what makes increasing biodiversity such a key, and I believe such a fundamentally important focus. Yeah, good insight. Thanks, Malcolm. And I, I, yeah, I think increasingly the more we hear about that, the more we listen to around that, that the more and more that shows up as a fundamental requirement of, of your, like a principle of re regenerative shift. Yeah. And Malcolm, is it fair to say that that whether we like it or not, we're managing those four mus musketeers at any at any given tick of the clock? Absolutely, and 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 it goes. And, and and for better and worse, it, 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 that's why you have to monitor because it's so complex. You don't always know. You, you can't know if you've got it right at the start. You, you can only learn from experience. Yeah. Well, again, I yeah, really appreciate your time and input, Malcolm. It's been a it's been a great session. I think you know, people have got a lot out of that and and. Uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, you know, um, they've taken, uh, yeah, it's helped them a lot in terms of that understanding. Um, 
you'll be we're, we're getting pretty close to the bottom of the hour so um we'll have to look at wrapping up but um so next week um same time same place um love to see you all back and hopefully more and um we've got um we'll be featuring greg hart next week greg's going to talk to us a little bit about yeah you know, his own background and and um the way the way it's worked for him i mean greg's been uh, i guess he's a pretty high profile regenerative farmer um and with, with what he's tried to do with the eco lodge and how that how that's evolved and his own experiences in that um i think will be pretty useful and um i look i look really look forward to his input next week and we'll also um talk a little bit more about this whole concept of um regenerative design and how we can actually change and change outcomes for the future so again thank you all for coming on board for your inputs into that and and um look forward to seeing you all again next week so thank you thank you very much thank you